everyone. Uh, to Welcome to the third day of the Astronomy and Space Exploration Society's annual symposium. Uh, wild that we're already at day three, but here we are. Uh, we have two fantastic talks today uh, to round out this event. And the first one here is, Dr. is by Dr. Aprajita Verma, uh, who is a senior researcher at the University of Oxford. Uh, she is a project scientist for the UK Extremely Large Telescope Program and in-kind program coordinator for the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. Uh, after completing her PhD and a short postdoc in the astrophysics group at Imperial College London, Aprajita was science research staff at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics and subsequently joined the sub-department of astrophysics at the University of Oxford. Her research interests cover a wide range of extragalactic topics, including dust, obscured star formation, and black hole hosting galaxies, high redshift galaxies, and strong gravitational lenses. She's also a founding member and co-lead of Space Warps, which is the Zooniverse uh, citizen science project to find gravitational lenses. Super cool. So without further ado, I'm very excited for this talk. Um, let's welcome uh, Aprajita. Take it away. Thanks very much, Stephanie, and, and thank you for this invitation to what sounds like a really great event. I'm very honoured to be here. So I'm going to tell you about a project that I'm really excited about. Um, I've been working on it for, for a number of years already. So as you may know, these astronomy projects take some time to get off the ground, but um, we're actually getting there with this one. So this is about the Extremely Large Telescope, which is a telescope being built by the European Southern Observatory with lots of um, membership uh, or contribution, shall I say, from the ESO member states. There's about 16 of them. You see their flags on the bottom of this slide. Um, and a lot of the material that you see comes from ESO um, videos and images that have been generated, but also um, some from some of my colleagues. Um, so particularly from the UK LT project team, Isabel Hook, uh, Colin Cunningham, Michele Sirisuolo, and um, Joe Liska. So thanks to them. So um, just to summarize the ELT in one slide, uh, it's basically going to be the world's largest telescope operating in the optical and near infrared wavelengths. It has a 39 meter diameter mirror and it's a fully adaptive telescope. And I'll talk a bit about that uh, later in the talk. It works in the uh, visible to the mid-infrared wavelength ranges, and it was approved back in December 2012, um, with first light expected in 2027. And the cost of this giant telescope is about 1.3 billion euros. That's in 2020 numbers. And it's very much a, a high strategic priority for ESO, um, and also a top priority for European ground-based astronomy. So before I talk, about the telescope itself, I'm just gonna go really far back to the beginnings of telescopic astronomy and just kind of go through how we ended up in this era of large telescopes. So as you can imagine, this story begins with Galileo back in 1608. Oh, it's really the birth of modern astronomy. And this is uh, basically, he turned Lippe-Hase magnifying spyglass to the skies and saw amazing things. He created really fantastic lenses and achieved magnifications of 20 times. And he could see things like sunspots, uh, craters and prominences on the moon, the moons of Jupiter, phases of Venus, and what he called the ears of Saturn. And this is really astounding work that has really laid the foundations for all of modern astronomy. So as you may know, um, most telescopes or, or what you may think of telescopes involves lenses, just like Galileo's. And actually the first giant lenses, uh, sorry, telescopes actually are pretty old. So refractors came along, which are kind of the, the lens driven telescopes that I mentioned. Um, and basically people like Kepler increased the field of view. They use convex rather than concave eyepieces. And this uh, animation that you see here just shows the ray diagram uh, that the light comes in from the sky, gets magnified into the eyepiece uh, to the observer. And the first giant version of this was back in 1673, where there was a 45 meter, um, or what was called three rooftop telescope. Um, but as you can see, this is huge. 
but it's very cumbersome. It's very difficult to steer it. But it, it, you know, the era of large telescopes started a long, long time ago. Then the, the real innovation that came in was in 1672 when Newton then used mirrors rather than lenses in the telescope. So here again, you see an animation where the light comes in to uh, a mirror at the bottom that then gets focused onto a secondary mirror here, and then that gets sent out to the eyepiece. And that basically gave rise to what we know as modern day telescopes that are far more compact in design. And that really was the, the kind of step that has created all our ground-based telescopes that we are familiar with today. And then in the 19th century, we had basically a lot of innovation in terms of um, kind of improving optics and then starting really in building giant refractors. So William Herschel um, built 400 telescopes in his lifetime, and he really was a pioneer in casting mirrors and casting mirrors of, of good quality. And he made the first large mirror, which is 1.26 meters across. Uh, and that really was astounding. Uh, we then had um, William Lassell, um, and William Parsons. So William Parsons built the Leviathan of Parsons Town, which again, for many years was the world's largest telescope well into the 20th century. That had a mirror of 1.83 meters. And again, he saw really stunning things, for example, like the structure of M51. William Lassell really took telescopes into precision engineering. So he used um, a vectorial mount. He had telescopes that involved tracking. Um, he also appreciated the importance of going to a good site. So he looked for dark places with dark skies and stable atmospheres. So some of his telescopes were on, on Malta. And remarkably, uh, he discovered Triton only 17 days after Neptune's discovery. And he also saw a multitude of really amazing things in the universe. Switching to the 20th century, we have George Ellery Hale um, in, in the US who basically built a huge number of really big telescopes. So we had the Yerkes uh, refractor, which is a 40 inch, um, and the Mount Winston uh, 60 inch reflector. And then really what is the birth of modern day telescopes is the Palomar Observatory, which by all, mean, by all um, measures was well ahead of its time. It was a 200 inch reflector. It's still in operation today. Um, and here, down here, you see a picture of it, and it really is an incredible place to visit. Um, the telescope is, you know, breathtaking. Its precision is really overwhelming, um, and it's, it's well worth a visit if you ever have a chance to go. So what changed in the 20th century was basically, you know, taking advantage of technology essentially. And a lot of that came in the actual mirror fabrication. So what you see here is the mirror of, of the Hale telescope that we were just talking about. So that's the 200 inch mirror. And then as I showed you before, this is the structure that's needed to kind of support it and move the mirror uh, and point it at the celestial source you want to look at. And then let's compare that to kind of more modern telescopes. So here's the William Herschel telescope that was built in, in the late 80s. And um, in the 2000s or just before the 8.1 meter Gemini telescope. And what you can see here is, is a clear difference between the structure that is the mirror. So the Hale telescope has a very, very heavy mirror. Um, it basically took many, many years just to pour the Pyrex to make this mirror blank. Um, and it, you know, if you compare that to these very much more thin, and lightweight mirrors that are currently used in modern telescopes. And you can see that actually that means that you have a lot more um, flexibility in how you actually construct the support um, that goes around this mirror to make the telescope. So if you compare the Palomar structure here to the structure of the Gemini telescope, what you can clearly see is that we've gone from very sturdy heavy design to something that's far more spindly and lightweight. And that means the telescope itself is much more maneuverable. It's also easier to maintain, build, and point to the accuracy that you need. And actually the Palomar structure here is built on old 
battleship technology that's very stable, whereas the new telescopes are very nimble in comparison. So the other thing to bear in mind is that a lot of the kind of image quality we get from telescopes is to do with the, the precision of the surface of the mirror. So actually to make a good quality mirror, you need something that's built to about 10% of the wavelength. So the VLT mirrors, um, the Gemini mirrors, they all work in the optical. So it has, in this example, I'm showing you the VLT mirror that has a diameter of 8.2 meters, but the precision of the surface of that mirror is actually you know, really, really small. So just to give you a flavor of what that precision actually means. So if you imagine um, ripples on the surface of water uh, that are just a few centimeters high, but you spread that over something the size of the Atlantic Ocean, that's the level of kind of machining you need and polishing on the surface of a mirror to get a high quality modern day mirror. Um, so that really is a technical challenge and couldn't be achieved without the technology that we have today. So this is essentially the kind of mirror that's used in all modern uh, large telescopes. So here you see some examples of the Paranal Observatory in Chile that hosts the very large telescopes, uh, Gemini North and South, which are in Chile and Hawaii that I mentioned already. Um, also the Keck telescopes um, on Mauna Kea, twin uh, 10 meter telescopes. And there you see the Keck primary mirror, the VLT primary mirror and the Gemini mirror. So again, you see this very kind of spindly structure with a very high precision surface mirror. So just to put that into some perspective, what, what so a lot of the telescopes that I've mentioned so far, um, they appear on this diagram. What this diagram is, is on the bottom axis here, you have the date, so essentially the year uh, from when these telescopes were founded. And on the, on the y-axis, you have basically the altitude of these telescopes. So what you see here is kind of the, the Hooker and the Hell telescope that I talked about earlier. Um, and there you see kind of, all the two, greater than two meter telescopes that are in professional use today. Um, there you see the Hale telescope really was the leader in terms of mirror size for many decades uh, until the WHT was built. And then you have a cluster of kind of four meter class telescopes, including uh, the Canada, France, Hawaii telescope that's in uh, on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Then we have the era of eight to 10 meter telescopes, which you, you see here, that includes the Keck, uh, on Hawaii um, and the VLTs and also the SALT telescope in South Africa. So I mentioned I'm going to talk about the ELT, so just to give you a flavor of what this, the size of the ELT is. So essentially, the primary mirror of the ELT at 39 meters is larger than all the other telescopes currently in use in terms of collecting area. So this really is a step change in terms of mirror aperture. And what we've noticed um, and what is true for every big step in, in telescopes is that every time we make these jumps from two meters to four meters to eight meters to now 30, 40 meter telescopes, we find out things about the universe that we really never knew before. So just to give you um, a feeling of, of what that is in terms of a soccer pitch. Sorry, I should have found a, a, a better comparison, but I hope some of you are familiar with, with soccer pitches. Um, the mirror of the ELT fits in about half of it in terms of diameter. So it's a pretty big thing. Next time you see a, a soccer pitch, then uh, hopefully you'll, you'll think about the ELT and how big just the reflecting area is. Incidentally, it's also, the same size as the world's largest pizza. Uh, that was uh, amazingly also 39 meters across and you could see more about that on the Guinness World of Records site. So how do we make these enormous mirrors? So I mentioned this kind of very high precision surface. So how do you do that on something that's a scale of, of 39 meters? Now actually um, we can't polish anything to the degree needed bigger than eight meters. So how do we build a 40 meter teles uh, telescope mirror? And you might have seen this from the, from the images before, I kind of gave it away. But what we do is that we use 
segmented mirrors. So this actually was pioneered back in the 1930s uh, by Guido Horn de Arturo at Bologna. And he made the first the, the world's first largest segmented mirror. So it was 1.8 meters across. And that really paved the way for doing this on, on larger scale. So indeed the Keck 10 meter telescope uses this uh, segmented mirror technology. So that's essentially how we make uh, mirrors for extremely large telescopes. Now, just to give you um, more background in that. So that's not the only way you can make primary mirrors that are large and, and the ELT is not, is not the only extremely large telescope. We also have the 30 meter telescope and the giant Magellan telescope. So with the giant Magellan telescope, they've gone for this kind of flower uh, petal design where you, they've actually just put together spherical or uh, circular mirrors, each of eight meters across. Uh, the TMT, which is the 30 meter telescope and the ELT, both use hexagonal segments that are about 1.4 meters across. And some of you may have read quite a lot about the James Webb Telescope that has been uh, scheduled for launch for many years and finally launched on, on Christmas day uh, last year. That also has uh, a much smaller, but also a segmented mirror that's actually coated in, in, in a gold uh, substance. So here you see kind of a flavor of, of what giant telescopes are, and that's in comparison to the very large telescope eight meter uh, mirror. I just wanna talk a bit more about the other ELTs because certainly the, the European ELT is not the only one. So I mentioned the 30 meter telescope and that's one that Canada has um, strong involvement in. Uh, that will either be built on Mauna Kea or uh, in La Palma in Spain. Uh, you can reach more or find out more information about that at the link that I've given there. There's also, as I mentioned, the giant Magellan telescope that has this kind of flower design for its mirror. And that still lets you take advantage of kind of um, the, well, I'll talk about this a bit later, the advantages of having a big mirror. It just means that you don't have a fully mirrored plane uh, because you've got kind of these circles that don't tessellate as well as the hexagons. So um, I use this term that um, an amateur astronomer told me. Uh, it's called aperture fever, which essentially, you know, it's getting bigger and bigger mirrors. So clearly professional astronomers suffer from the same. So you saw this kind of progression in terms of mirror size. And so why, why is this important? So the key aspects are that if you have a bigger mirror, it's essentially like having a light bucket. The bigger your mirror, the more photons you collect, so the more sensitive you are. So it's a bit like your pupils dilating in the dark. It just lets you measure more light. Uh, the other is spatial resolution. So as you get bigger and bigger diameters of mirrors, you can actually resolve smaller details. So you can get a much deeper and a much finer view of the universe than was previously possible. So this is really what's fueling some of this uh, aperture fever and this move to bigger and bigger mirrors. So when I say that, what do I mean by, you know, bigger, better, deeper, more sensitive? So I'm going to go through some uh, information about that. So if we think about image quality, it's kind of like what we see from the sky and how good and how well defined objects are. So this is what we call seeing limited. So this is kind of what you would see with a telescope, uh, any telescope, the atmosphere, turbu or atmospheric turbulence actually blurs out images. And that's what is called seeing. And that seeing, that blurriness creates um, kind of fuzzy images. So I'll again show some videos on this later. But if you took a typical patch of sky, a very small patch of sky that is about one arc second across, any typical region, this is just a mock-up of kind of, to give you a flavor of quality. This is what you would see in, in the seeing limited mode compared to what you would see from space. So I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with Hubble Space Telescope images, you know, really groundbreaking uh, imagery that has basically revolutionized astronomy. But you can see, you know, this apparently fuzzy region is actually broken up into so multiple sources. 
they all seem to be very different. They have different colors. Uh, you can see these kind of red sources that are more diffuse. You can see kind of stars of different colors, orange, yellow, and white. Um, but you wouldn't see that normally if you were just looking in the seeing limited mode from the ground. If we compare that to what uh, an eight meter telescope could be, now you really start to see much more structure in the background, many more individual sources. You can see that bright blob in the center is actually made up of many, many discrete sources. Um, and so you get even more information. And then moving to something like a 40 meter telescope, all these kind of faint blobs really start to pop out. You can see really fine and detailed structure in the sky. So that's really what we're trying to aim for um, with uh, extremely large telescopes. So I mentioned seeing, I mentioned atmospheric blurring. So what do we do about that? So this is just a, a picture, a, another simulation of, of a crater on the moon. Uh, in what we, you know, the atmospheric or seeing limited uh, mode compared to what it would look like if there was no atmosphere. So it's essentially like looking at the universe through a swimming pool. You've got kind of the, the water moving that's distorting the image as well as blurring the image. So you lose a lot of information. So if we think about what the, the seeing does to stars, so when we're looking at a star, through the atmosphere. This is, uh, again, an animation of what you would typically see. You don't see something very strong and stable. You see something that's moving around, distorted. Um, and, you know, that's not the greatest thing to actually, you know, recover very high quality images. So what we want to do is go from basically this very blurry image to the actual kind of, um, the image quality that you can get that's determined essentially by the optics of the telescope itself. So the atmosphere is very, very definitely affecting the spatial information that we can achieve, but it also limits the sensitivity because if you move from kind of the seeing limited mode to a corrected mode, so this image down here is actually that kind of uh, image that you would expect that would just be dominated by the optics of the telescope, you can see this very faint fuzzy blob becomes something with a very bright core. And so that's actually increasing your sensitivity. So how do we do this from the ground? Okay, so I'm gonna show you a movie now from something in, <clears throat> from the Gemini telescope. So what we use is a technique called adaptive optics. Uh, this is um, something that is currently in operation on many telescopes. Um, it is kind of a way of overcoming the atmospheric dis uh, disturbance. So what you see here is, is the Gemini telescope, light comes in, gets reflected, and it then goes, gets sent to another instrument that's called Altair, or you know, different AO uh, adaptive optics instruments have different names. What that light is then sent into a system um, and in that system, there's another mirror that you see up here, okay? So the light is coming in, gets reflected off this mirror, and this is kind of the atmospherically disturbed light. Now, some of that light gets sent down here and is fed back onto this mirror, and which you could see in this movie was actually not flat, it was actually distorted. And what you do is that you monitor the light that's coming off. So this is going to run through again while I explain it. So you have this disturbed image of the star, but you know from your telescope design what um, the telescope should deliver without the atmosphere. And so you can take the difference and the difference therefore is the atmospheric turbulence. And by applying the inverse of that difference onto the surface of this deformable mirror, you can take the distorted wave fronts and make them flat again. And that's effectively eliminating the effect of the atmosphere. So we'll just look at this movie a little bit more just to explain what, what I just said again. It's easier to see in pictures rather than words. So the light comes in um, and we're monitoring a star. We know what that star should look like. And so we've got this kind of fuzzy image and we know what the star is look like. We take the difference. So we're continuously monitoring that star. The difference is then calculated just algorithmically in a computer and it's the inverse is applied to the surface of the mirror. 
So you see now that that surface of the mirror is making those wave fronts flat. And on the screen there, you'll see, you know, a really compact star. So that's essentially what lets us get space quality images, but from the ground. So uh, with that in mind, essentially what we're doing is by going from these kind of fuzzy atmospherically disturbed um, stars, or what we call point sources, because um, stars are very much a, a just a point of light. So the seeing limited size of a star basically just spreads out the light. So if you can eliminate um, the atmospheric disturbance, you can actually improve the amount of sensitivity you have by a factor of the one over, the, or let's say by the diameter size to the power four. So this is actually quite a powerful um, increase. So you've got basically more light coming in because of the, the diameter of the telescope. And when you use a telescope with adaptive optics, you're also then focusing the light into a much smaller area, fewer detect pixels, so that increases your sensitivity. So compared to the current eight meter telescopes, we can get five times better angular resolution um, from the ELTs um, and 500 times faster exposures because of the adaptive optics on, on stars and point sources. So there's a large gain in sensitivity by building extremely large telescopes with adaptive optics. Now, the, this whole system relies on you having a star available. But if we look at, um, this is an image of the Hubble deep field. So this was a patch of um, extragalactic sky or apparently empty sky that's actually full of, of sources. Um, but what you can see from this image here is that there's very few stars. There's actually one here and one here. And these are so faint that we don't typically pick them up. And to do good adaptive optics corrections, you actually need bright stars. So this is a real problem in terms of doing uh, extragalactic work. You know, if I want to look at this galaxy in detail, I need to have bright stars around it to do that adaptive optics correction. So the next level of innovation from uh, modern telescopes is actually to use laser guide stars. So you essentially create your own artificial star. And these are already in operation on several telescopes across the globe. And the idea is, is that you fire a laser up to the sodium layer in the atmosphere, it creates a fake star. And instead of monitoring a real star, or let's say you actually monitor real stars as well as your laser guide stars, it means that you can basically look and do this kind of correction in most places across the sky. And I'll just show you very quickly, I'm kind of running out of time a little bit. So there was a non-sky demonstrator at the William Herschel Telescope, which is in La Palma in the Canary Islands. And this was a non-sky demonstrator for the ELT on a telescope that's about 10 times smaller. And this is literally one of the images that came off this laser guide star demonstrator. And within 20 minutes, um, basically, they could see a huge amount of detail. So nothing really fancy has been done in terms of image processing here. So this is um, basically a, a, a binary black hole. So it's a galaxy that has two colliding um, galaxies. And in each of those galaxies, there's a black hole. So these are the centers of those galaxies. And um, what you see here is the HST image and the corrected image using adaptive optics. So just blowing up the, the bottom, uh, the core of the bottom galaxy here or the southern galaxy, what you see here is the HST image compared to 20 minutes on the WHT, uh, which as I mentioned is, is 10 times smaller in diameter with this canary laser system. So you can see we can already achieve better than HST quality from the ground. And this is you know, on a much smaller telescope than what the ELT will be. So you see a similar improvement on the, on the northern uh, blob there as well. So again, just to give you a flavor of what I mean by more sensitive or more deep and more fine, um, just, you know, if you imagine um, a crater on the moon. So this is the Moltke crater uh, close to the Apollo 11 site uh, on the surface of the moon. So if you were to point the ELT to, at the moon, which we obviously won't do, but if you were, um, so the Moltke crater is about six kilometers across. 
the actual detail you could resolve on the surface of the moon is about the size of, of a bus, about 10 meters across. Um, and there's a little, that little red dot is actually a few hundred times larger than 10 meters on the surface of the moon. So that gives you a feeling for the kind of scale or the zoom power of the ELT. In terms of sensitivity or depth, if you imagine a single candle flame, um, you could see the change in flux of the light of the moon if you were to light a candle on the moon at that distance. So we're not going to light candles on the moon because obviously there's no oxygen or atmosphere there to light it, but it just gives you a flavour of what we mean by increased sensitivity. So it's an incredibly zoom powered and very sensitive instrument. So I'm going to move on now. I don't know if anyone has questions on that part of the talk. I'm now going to move on to more kind of ELT specific um, bits of the talk. Was there anything, Stephanie, you wanted to? Uh, there were a few questions, but I think we can probably save them for the end. OK. So uh, as I mentioned, the primary mirror is made up of these hexagonal segments that you see here. Um, and this is just a, a blow up a, of that or a cartoon of what that might work. Oh, sorry. So what you see there is kind of the, the full 39 meter across primary. And what it has is actually 798 individual segments that are each um, 1.4 meters point to point in the hexagon across. Here's one of them. And behind each of these hexagonal segments, you'll see these green things or, or down here, these blue things are actually pistons um, and they or uh, actuators and they essentially there's three of these behind every segment in the mirror um, and they basically preserve the surface of the mirror so it keeps all the mirrors aligned and it moves because this whole telescope right has to track objects in the sky so, so the whole cradle moves as the telescope uh, is tracking an object and each of these pistons are working all the time just to maintain that parabolic shape of the mirror that you can vaguely see uh, hopefully in this image and behind it is this structure again as lightweight as it can be um, but behind each there's kind of these uh, additional pistons and other structures so this is actually a prototype of one of the mirror segments and here you see the actuators in place um, and then each side of this mirror has two edge sensors because then each, each segment knows where the next segment is as well. So it's constantly calculating its position, making corrections and preserving that parabolic shape of the mirror. So these things are actually being fabricated now. Uh, they're all ready to be produced. So the whole ELT itself is a five mirror design. So you have this big primary mirror um, which we call M1, that the light there, which I've kind of got out of sync with this. So the light comes in from the sky, hits M1, goes up to a secondary mirror, M2, down to a third mirror, M3, then to M4, and finally just a fold mirror that sends light either side to the instruments that I'll talk about shortly. Um, but basically that's the design, the five mirror design of the telescope. And it's very innovative and it's very fast. Um, and it allows this giant mirror to be actually uh, produced. So I'm going to talk a bit more about uh, M2 and M4 um, and then kind of go through bits about the, the telescope itself. So this is kind of giving you a flavor of what uh, M2 is. So this is the William Herschel telescope that I've mentioned a couple of times now. This is a 4.2 meter telescope, very similar in size to the CFHTLS, the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope, um, which is also about four meters across. So if you imagine this is like a, a big telescope itself, right? But we're actually then suspending it over this giant primary. So again, you know, we're taking a giant telescope that's already in existence and suspending it over this giant mirror. So again, just to give you an idea of the size of this thing. Uh, that's just a, a closer in view of what M2 will look like. And that's currently being manufactured, as are the primary segments. Uh, many of them have been cast and are ready for polishing. So I mentioned um, the, the M5 mirror sends light out uh, to these platforms. 
So these platforms are, are called Naismith platforms. So that's kind of from the design of the telescope. And that's where the eyes of the telescope, uh, the instruments, the cameras and the spectrographs that I'll talk about a bit later sit. And just to give you another size reference, these platforms themselves are kind of like the size of tennis courts. So these are huge things. You can see a tiny man down there. This whole structure moves to arc second precision um, so that it can track astronomical uh, objects. Um, and it's really heavy, right? It's 3,700 tons, but it, it's designed to move beautifully. Um, so it's still, I think what I wanted to, to say with this slide is just so that you get an appreciation of the kind of engineering that goes into making precision instruments on, on this scale. Uh, so I mentioned this kind of adaptive optics and the adaptive optics correction in ELT is fully integrated. So the Gemini video that we saw earlier that kind of took the light of the telescope and then did something to it after it had been kind of collected. In the ELT, this deformable mirror is actually in that five mirror design. So that is M4, which sits at the top of this tower. Um, and basically, um, there's a, you know, a, a mirror that has about 5,000 actuators. So you have a higher density of actuators or pistons than what I mentioned for the primary mirror that are continuously correcting the surface of that mirror to account for the adapter, uh, for the disturbance in the atmosphere. And these yellow tubes that you see around here are the laser guide stars. So these fake stars or the lasers that are capable of making fake stars to do the adaptive optics um, correction. So that's all built into the system before the light gets sent to the instruments. The dome itself is huge. It's about the size of um, a, a medium sized stadium. It's about, it has an 88 meter footprint. It's about 80 meters high. It's fully air conditioned and it's seismically uh, isolated. And that whole thing has to kind of protect the mirror during the day, but also open up so we can do good observing at night. Um, there's also a windshield that comes up to, to minimize the turbulence within the dome. So um, in, to kind of maximize the return from the telescope, it has to be in a good place. So I've mentioned kind of some of the sites. So the ELT will be in Chile. Um, this is a, an aerial shot of, of the site. And basically what you see here is Paranal, which is um, where the very large telescopes are. There's four of those that you see sitting here along with a couple of other telescopes on, on this uh, peak. And this arrow here that points to Amazonas is where the ELT will be. Doesn't look like that anymore and I'll come to that in a minute. But what you can see here from the landscape is it's very barren. Um, the image quality on this site is exceptional. So what you see here is a volcano. Uh, I'm gonna say this wrong, Luliaco, I believe. Uh, but this is like 200 kilometers away from Paranal. And you really can actually see, I don't know if this comes across in your, your screens, but you can actually see quite a lot of detail on this volcano. Um, and that just gives you a reflection of how good the image quality is on this site. Um, and that the reason for this is that, I hope it comes up in a minute. Um, so this is just like a cutout. So this is Chile here. Um, this is um, basically where Paranal is, and this is just a blow up of that region. Um, this is sea level, and then this is kind of the area around Paranal, and then the area around Amazonas. And what you see here is that, you know, within about 20 kilometers from the coast, um, basically you're going from sea level up to about 3,000 meters. And what that means is that all the kind of bad weather um, gets stuck on what's uh, at this kind of steep in, um, steep step up to where the, um, the Atacama Desert is. And that basically means that you get essentially very good weather above what we call this inversion layer. So that's why um, this site is so barren. Um, there's very little rain. Uh, there's sometimes snow. There are high winds, but essentially you can get about 300 to 320 clear nights of weather uh, every year. And that's really, you know, it's one of the most exceptional sites uh, to do astronomy in the world. And the reason why um, this site was picked for, for the ELT was that it meant because it's this uh, separation is only about 20 kilometers. 
It meant that a lot of the infrastructure that's been developed for Paranal um, could also be utilized um, for the ELT, which actually made it more cost effective. So what does the site look like? So this is what it used to look like. Um, and then ESO basically started building or first blasting um, the top of the mountain off. Um, that's kind of a, a small explosion. Um, and basically it has to be done in small explosions. There's no big boom that shatters everything because what you want to do is maintain the structural integrity of the peak. Um, so this was done in, in many, many small explosions. And this is the flattened uh, Amazonas peak. And now there's been a significant amount of construction. Uh, the foundations are laid. And actually, this is also quite old. Even despite COVID, they've made significant progress in, in building up the site. Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit because I want to get to the science. But I did mention these kind of instruments. So these are what we call the eyes of the telescope. These are things that are collecting the photons and turning them into images or spectra that we can then analyze. And there's a bunch of different instruments that are in themselves, hugely technologically complex. Um, and they will basically um, do all the measurements and allow astronomers to, uh, to take measurements of the sky. So I won't go into those because um, I'm running short of time. So I'm going to move now to, you know, why we're doing this at all. So I've mentioned, you know, the image quality and, and the sensitivity, but that has to be rooted in, in the science that we want to do. And there's three kind of elements to the ELT science case. There's what we call contemporary science. That's the science that we know now and can do with existing telescopes and what um, we might do in the future um, with telescopes such as the ELT. So that covers a huge range of science. So that includes planets and stars, uh, includes stars and galaxies, and it includes, um, oops, sorry, distant galaxies, kind of the first galaxies that formed and cosmology. And I'm gonna touch on all of these. I don't really have time to go into any in great detail, but I'll come back to the science drivers in a moment. Uh, the second pillar of the ELT science case is synergy with other facilities. And what I mean by this is, is the ELT does not sit in isolation in our understanding of the universe. So this is just a, a figure showing the electromagnetic spectrum of um, the, you know, we have in the world. So that ranges from the radio right through to the high energy gamma rays. Um, and what you see here is this band called the visible, which is essentially what our eyes are sensitive to. And this is a remarkably narrow band. And you can see it actually there's a lot more energy in the universe in different bands than in the visible. But um, bearing in mind this kind of history of telescopic um, astronomy that I mentioned before, you know, this visible range is really what has dominated our knowledge of the universe up to about, you know, the 1960s. So that's really, you know, because our eyes have been sensitive to it, that's where we've built most of our sensors. So what I'm going to show you now is kind of like a view of a galaxy called Centaurus A. This is a, a compilation of images created by Angel Lopez Sanchez. Um, and this is this is quite a, let's say, not, not the most interesting galaxy. What you see is this kind of fuzz of white light, which is stars, but across it, you've got quite a dramatic band of black, which is essentially dust um, that gets basically blocks the light from the stars. So all you can see really is this fuzzy glow and the, the kind of blocked out light in the dust, but not much more. So when this galaxy was looked at in the radio, which you see here in these kind of blue contours, something actually very dramatic is happening, right? You, you get a whole different view of this galaxy. It's not just a blob of stars with a bit of dust. There's something unusual happening there. And this was kind of also reflected in the X-rays, um, which kind of followed this kind of extension that you see in the radio. And then when with the advent of infrared telescopes, that allows you to actually probe through the, um, the dust. So what happens is with the dust, you see kind of, you've got this black band that you see here, 
right? And then with the infrared telescopes, that dust that's actually there, it's absorbing the optical light and it's not letting it through. That's why you see the blackness. But when you look at the dust in the infrared, that then you actually can then see the light that's re-radiated by that black dust. So what you see here is it means that you can actually look through the dust in the infrared. And what you know, quickly became clear was that at the center of this galaxy, there's something extremely compact and, and very powerful. And that is the source that's re uh, responsible for these jets and lobes that you see in the X-ray and the radio. And that's because it's an energetic black hole. And then, uh, you know, I'll talk about, I won't really talk about the UV, but essentially the point I'm trying to make is that you can't look at the universe only in one, you know, this very narrow sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum. What modern day astronomy is, is really a multi-wavelength effort. And that's what gives you an understanding of the, of the universe. So this is just a selection of kind of telescopes that are currently online or coming online. And the ELT, or and including the other ELTs, are just one part of this much bigger picture. And it's only with this bigger picture can we really understand the nature of the universe. So what I mean by synergy with other facilities is, for example, this is um, observations of planetary uh, disks. So these are solar systems outside our own around other stars and it's the disks in which um, we think planets are forming and this is data from the ALMA telescope and you know when I looked at this the first time it looked very much like you know one of those artistic artists impressions of what an emerging disk would look like or an emerging planetary system but this is actually real data so you can see here you know kind of disks of, of dust and gas and these kind of rings are representing where planets are kind of forming and clearing out sections of the disk. And, you know, this is stunning detail. And ELTs um, will be able to produce images of similar spatial resolution. So this is data taken in the uh, millimeter. So very, uh, you know, almost radio wavelengths. And with the ELT, we'll be able to do comparable kind of scale stuff uh, but in the visible, not necessarily on these objects themselves, but there's a complementarity or a synergy there between having observations from different facilities at similar uh, resolution, but very different wavelengths. Uh, I can't do this talk without mentioning James Webb again. So that has a complementarity or synergy with ELT in that it has slightly poorer resolution in the wavelengths that that uh, the ELT will operate. So it's about six times worse resolution, but it also has very high sensitivity, but it, and it also extends into the mid infrared. So again, for the objects we see with the ELT, we can get additional information from the James Webb and vice versa. The James Webb um, sources that are discovered can be then followed up with the ELT in greater detail. And I'm just gonna quickly go through um, Kind of the other project that I work on, which is the Rubin, um, the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, which is going to take the first ever movie of the sky. Um, this works in, in the visible, um, whereas the ELT goes visible and, and up to the mid infrared. But there's a huge difference here in what, although they're working in similar wavelengths, they have very different capabilities. The Vera C. Rubin Observatory is a survey telescope, so it's going to take pictures of huge areas of the sky. So this is its um, focal plane of detectors. And there you can see the moon. So you can see how much of the sky it's imaging in any one shot. And compare that to what I was telling you about the ELT a bit earlier. There you're looking at objects that, you know, the resolution of 10 meters on the moon compared to, you know, many moons. So what the synergy here is, is that the source is being discovered by, uh, by the survey being done by the Rubin telescope will then feed the ELT with targets. Okay, so the biggest or the third pillar of the ELT science case is discovery potential. I mentioned already as we go in these step changes in, in telescope size, we learn way more about the universe. And I already mentioned the Hubble Deep Field. This is an example of that. Uh, this is like a second generation on the Hubble Deep Field. It's called the Ultra Deep Field, so they look for even longer. But what that was, was basically staring, uh, was a 
apparently blank bit of sky, but this is by no means blank, right? It's littered with really interesting objects that are very diverse. No object looks really the same. Um, and it's basically, its legacy is, you know, millions of astronomer hours, millions of papers have come out from these images alone. So this is really, you know, revolutionized what we could, what we know about the universe. And that's what we can expect with new instruments like the ELTs. Um, so I'm going to move back onto the contemporary science. So I'm just going to touch on a few. I'm actually not going to talk about exoplanets because that was covered in a talk um, that was on Thursday by Gael Chauvin. So please do refer to that. But, you know, this is looking at planetary systems beyond our own solar system. And it's really an area where the ELT will make a significant um, impact. I'll talk about stars and galaxies and galaxies and cosmology. Um, the context in which I want to kind of frame this is like, this is a great figure that was generated by NASA, which basically encapsulates the whole universe in one slide. So this, you start with a big bang right through to the present day. And what this kind of bell shape is showing you is um, kind of the, what we call the cosmic background afterglow. This is a remnant of, of the big bang. And there's a period before actually there was anything in the universe. There was no light at all, no stars, no galaxies. And this is what we call the cosmic dark ages. Then we have the birth of the first stars. Um, these basically then evolve, start um, developing, evolving, and eventually end up in the kind of common galaxies that we know today. And essentially the ELT will address questions right from the dark ages right through to the present day. So I mentioned exoplanets that I'll just touch on very briefly, just that one of the key goals of the ELT is to detect the first Earth-like planet. So what they want to do is get down to rocky planets, not kind of massive Jupiters that are basically very gassy planets. Um, they want to get down to things that are like Earth. And I'm afraid I don't really have time to talk about it at the moment, but there's various astronomical techniques that we can do with spectroscopy um, that not only will get us down to the kind of masses uh, and it's essentially a contrast ratio between the star and the galaxy itself, but it lets, sorry, the exoplanet, um, it lets, can even let us look at the atmospheres of these things and potentially look for biomarkers in these extrasolar planets. So I'm going to focus more on, on this part, which is the, the formation of galaxies. So what you can see in this cartoon here is that you've got these kind of first stars and these kind of very blue light dominated compact sources. And then uh, in the present day, you've got things that look much bigger they look much more organized. So some, we know something's happened in the universe um, in terms of galaxy evolution. And we know that this kind of change happened or there's like a peak of star formation activity about 5 billion years ago. Um, so what we see here is, is more the galaxies that we see in the present day. So there's a huge menagerie of galaxy types. They have very different morphologies. We have these kind of grand design spirals we have kind of elliptical galaxies that look fairly uniform and not so exciting. Um, we also have a bunch of irregular galaxies. We have kind of more um, interacting galaxies that seem to be smashing into each other. And we still have lots of open questions about when and how did galaxies form? How did they build up their stars? Um, why are there so many different types of galaxies? And what's the dark matter, which um, again is, is a huge open problem at the moment that is essentially defining where these galaxies form and how do they influence the galaxies that we see. So the ELT, because it has this high um, spatial resolution, one of the science cases it will address is this kind of formation of galaxies, essentially how are galaxies built up? So we'll look at kind of the stellar population. So these are the stars within galaxies, not just in our own Milky Way, but in external galaxies. And it will be able to see how, you know, this, this diagram at the bottom is, is a simulation of, of how the Milky Way was built up. So essentially there's lots of kind of other neighboring galaxies streaming in, their stars are getting accreted into the, the Milky Way itself, as well as the ongoing star formation within the Milky Way. 
And imagine, you know, we're, we're doing that already in the Milky Way now, but with the ELT, you'll be able to do that in external galaxies and really look at how these different populations of galaxies that have come in, as well as those that have formed in situ, um, kind of what the history of those galaxies are. So that's really exciting stuff. And not only can we image these stars, so individual stars in external galaxies, we can also take spectra of them and learn a lot more about where they came from and the nature of these um, populations within galaxies. Um, we also want to look at really exciting things like black holes. I showed the Centaurus A1. Um, there are literally, we think every massive galaxy has had a black hole phase. Uh, these are extremely energetic events and they really can have a, a dramatic effect on the evolution of a galaxy. Uh, they come in all sorts of sizes. Um, they can range from very small ones that are in small star clusters right into very massive ones that are in the centers of massive galaxies. Um, and so there's a huge amount of open questions in terms of black hole physics, their presence, statistics. There's, there's a lot we can do. Um, this is just a, a movie from the Event Horizon telescope. I think this is a couple of years old now, but essentially they were able to image the light around the black hole. That was really a, a fundamental discovery and, and really quite exciting. And we hope to see more from them. In terms of the ELT, um, you may have seen um, the Nobel Prize for Physics last year was, was awarded for the work on the Galactic Center. This essentially is mapping the potential around the galactic center black hole and the stars, it's basically tracking the motion of stars around it. And that basically tells you a lot about what the, the center of the galaxy or the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, what its mass is um, and other properties. You can do tests of general relativity that you may also read about um, recently in the news. And this is really quite staggering work that has been built up over the last 30 years in terms of what the ELT can do or ELTs. This is an animation um, from the 30 meter telescope. And what you see here is, you know, we kind of had this movie in the last one where you see a bunch of stars. This is from data from the VLTs going to a, a 30 meter class telescope. You can see much more, right? You can resolve much more. You can see much fainter stars and again, get better precision measurements on what's going on in our own galactic center. Um, so going even further back to these very early galaxies, so I mentioned we've got these kind of well-ordered or bigger, less exciting galaxies in, in the current or the nearby universe. In the distant universe, we have these very uh, complex, but less massive, highly star forming galaxies. So you might remember in the Hubble ultra deep field that I showed you, there's kind of this background of, of, of blue or white blobs peppered all over the image. Um, that's essentially the picture of very young galaxies. And these are the first stars and galaxies. So while we, we know many first galaxies now, but we don't really know an awful lot about them. So if you look at them, they look very different to that kind of menagerie of galaxies that I showed you before. They're very compact, but they do have some differences, right? They're not all simple blobs. You can see pairs, you can see chains, you can see links between them, but we really don't know all that much yet. And even though we know them with eight meter class telescopes, we can discover them. We can't really understand a lot about the physics that's going on in them or their structures but we need something like the ELT with its high spatial resolution and sensitivity actually look at these galaxies in detail. And that's one of the things that ELT will address. So I've mentioned kind of like dark matter, um, and this is kind of a simulation of what we think the dark matter in the universe looks like. So this is kind of the fabric of the universe and any galaxy that you see, essentially we think forms wherever you see white here. So this is a concentrations of dark matter. This is where the actual, what we call baryonic mass also coalesces to form the first stars and galaxies. Um, and I'm gonna skip this. This is about space warps. Just go ahead and have a look at that. This is a way of looking at galaxies in even more detail. So you use kind of gravitational lensing to magnify and amplify light from very distant galaxies, but just head on over to the space warps website if you want to hear more about that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of cosmology aspects to the ELT. 
and only one of them. There's still many questions it can do, but I'm just going to focus on this one since I'm way over time. But essentially with this bell jar, what you might see is that, you know, there's a flaring here in this, in this kind of schematic of what the universe looked like. And what that essentially is, is um, this is the expansion of the universe, this kind of slope that you see here. But at some point, what we know from recent measurements, so the 2011 um, Nobel Prize was awarded to what we call the cosmological expansion. So not only is the universe accelerating, uh, sorry, expanding, it's also accelerating. So what the ELT will be able to do, and I'll be very quick, um, Stephanie. So what this is, is kind of a view into the structure of the universe. So that dark matter web that I showed you, that's the same as this structure that you see here. So you look at a, a very bright source called a quasar that you're looking through much of the um, matter or this structure in the universe. And what these, what you see down here is a spectrum. And each of these dips is looking at that quasar and each dip represents a bit of structure in the kind of in the fabric of the universe. So I'm just gonna flick to a second image. Can you see that slight shift? Right, so what that shift is the actual expansion of the universe. So by monitoring about 20 to 40 uh, quasars with the ELT and a high resolution spectrograph, um, you'll be able to actually measure the direct expansion of the universe. So that shift I showed you is very much you know what you could do in about a million years which we don't have but that was just to show you what this shift is but it is actually possible with very high resolution instruments so i just wanted to make the point that and i hope you've got this through my talk that really astronomy would not be where it is today without technology without um, computing and high precision engineering all those things are needed and that's what real astronomy is these days um, I just wanted to give you one last size reference. So this is um, the Peace Tower um, in Ontario, I believe. Um, and that's about the height that the ELT dome will be. There's a bunch of links here. Please follow that up uh, if, you're, if you're more interested in more information. And I'm just going to take questions while I play a video of us constructing the ELT at Oxford uh, out of Lego. So thank you for your attention and my Sincere apologies for going heavily over time. Thank you so much, Aprajita. That was such an interesting talk on so many different levels and so many different telescopes. And this ELT seems like it's really going to touch so many subfields of astronomy, which is, yeah, just remarkable. It sounds amazing. Um, we have so many questions, which is why <laughs> I wanted to get to some of them. Um, if you're okay to stay for a couple more yeah, minutes. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So great. Um, one of the questions we had here in the chat was someone was saying, you know, why are space telescopes so much smaller than ground based telescopes when you gave us that size reference? And is it something to do with the atmosphere? Why is this the case? So it's actually limited by what the launch telescopes can fit in. So you may have seen if you if you look at the JWST animations, what they had to do. So that's the largest mirror that's currently in space. That's six and a half meters across. But to actually launch it, they had to fold it up. Um, so actually, you know, the two outer rings effectively were, were um, folded in just so that it would fit in the top of the rocket. I do have an image of how it's um, folded up earlier uh, in, in one of my slides, but I, I won't show it now. But that's the main reason it's actually physically not possible to launch anything bigger. Um, and in a way, Jade. WWST is the pioneer in terms of folding up um, telescopes and launching them into space. Um, the other thing is you've got to take account of weight. So you can't, again, you know, put large mirrors out into space. It's just not technically feasible because all space telescopes are designed to be very lightweight and as lightweight as possible because that limits obviously how much um, the rocket can launch. But having said that, there are plans to um, kind of launch um, clusters of telescopes and so not usually in the optical. So uh, it depends. There's, there's a few that are being considered where you basically have smaller telescopes that are linked that can then effectively make a large mirror, a bit like a, a radio interferometer on the ground or, or the ALMA observatory. 
was it mostly about size or was there a question on on why there um sorry yeah it was mostly about size but i guess as a follow-up question is there do we have do we ever reach a threshold some maximum kind of limit where you know the resolution keeps getting better and better but you know you can only make a mirror i imagine so large and is yeah. there at some point where the mirror is just you know like some number some range where going beyond this there's actual like the science benefit kind of diminishes for the cost and the uh construction of that yeah so like the elt started off its life in terms of planning as a hundred meter telescope so actually the reason why it came down to 39 is because again, the technology and all those factors that you mentioned kind of limit what's actually practically feasible. And when you, you know, you have billion dollar projects, you want them to be achievable. So there's a huge, you know, number of years of trade-off studies that people put into designing any big telescope into what actually they can deliver with reasonable risk you know risks that they can manage or literally that they know they can build it and that's the reason why the elt is is the size it is um i think for space telescopes it's even more complicated because at least on the ground you can take advantage of of new technologies when you send things into space you have to have guaranteed technologies that are not going to fail so often the things that are being flown are actually more basic um, but also more sound in the sense that they are perhaps five, 10 years older um, because they know that they're not going to fail and you don't need to take that decision when you're doing stuff on the ground. So there's lots of trade-offs in these things, but going back to your point about, is there a limit? I would say no. You know, we, <laughs> I think that the limit comes from the external factors, like whether it's practical, whether you can build it rather than, um, an observable limit, but there's certainly a case of if you want to go bigger, why do you want to go bigger? So you need to justify that, you know, these huge cost telescopes are actually going to deliver science that is going to make some significant progress because you wouldn't build another, you know, or a, a bigger ELT unless you were sure you were going to find something. Um, and so we can all, we can predict that from the contemporary science cases the unknown bit, which is actually the most exciting bit, we obviously can't really predict what, what that's going to be. Right. And I guess just getting back to ground-based telescopes, um, someone was saying, you know, turbulence is really hard to accurately model. So for these ground-based telescopes, how do we actually compute or calculate the turbulence in the atmosphere at all of these different sites? So there's lots of different flavors of adaptive optics. Um, there's kind of like the simplest one you can do is you just take the integrated turbulence across all layers and you make a correction. So nothing that we do is a perfect correction. Um, and basically we, it depends on the number. Well, there's, lot, there's lots of things that go into adaptive optics, but effectively you can make improvements that don't get you back to um, 100% you know, no atmosphere, but they can get you very close. And you know, I showed you that image of, of a star where it's got a very bright core and, and the rings around it. So essentially you can still get, you know, 70% of the light focused into that core by doing some um, adaptive optics. And as I mentioned, that can either be averaged all through the different layers of turbulence, but there's also flavors adaptive optics that you kind of target different layers of turbulence. And so you'll have a mirror that's conjugated to each layer of turbulence. So they're doing their own correction for that bit. And this, you know, they've actually done this in practice with, with demonstrators. So I agree it's really hard and it's really complicated. And I'm not an expert in that at all, but kind of results speak for themselves because we've seen these massive improvements in the information and the spatial resolution we can get back. Uh, from these existing systems. So it's not 100% there, but it's it's good enough for us to get space quality images from the ground. Right. So I guess we're just a little bit short on time here. So maybe just to end it off, we'll end with one more question here, which is a bit different. Um, but someone's saying, you know, there's so many cool images and videos, simulations you showed in your talk today. 
Um, how much of a scientist or specifically, specifically an astronomer's job is graphic design and, you know, communicating your science to the public? I think that's a great question and it's not really obvious. And I think the answer equally isn't obvious. So partly it is, so we have these great, um, you know, media and outreach communications people at ESO who, who generate all these fantastic images. And that's true for the uh, other things, like other telescopes I showed as well. In terms of how, you know, your average astronomer engages with that, like I, I couldn't do it. I don't think many people I know could do it, but I think a lot of us, you know, these things are kind of generated not only for the public, but also for us to communicate to a public. And, and you can see it's very effective, much easier than me drawing on a blackboard or something. And in terms of how we engage with the public is, you know, there, there's obviously, you know, as in society, there's lots of different personalities in astronomers as well. So some of them are very keen on outreach and engagement and like giving these kind of public talks. And then we use these excellent resources that are generated by the telescopes. If there's a science result that we've done ourselves, we'll probably spend some time in terms of, you know, creating animations or stories to go along with them. We may go to external graphic designers to help us put those ideas together a bit more professionally, but obviously that costs money. Um, and so I think the engaged people do a bit of everything, you know, they'll do a bit of graphic design. Um, they'll certainly try and publicize their results and communicate their results. Um, but equally, there are astronomers who don't, don't do that very much as well, just because it, it's not something that they feel comfortable doing. So there's the whole range of stuff, but there's certainly a huge industry in science communication. And I don't think we could do as well without them, frankly. Totally. Well, on that note, it is 15 past, so we'll probably end it here. But thank you so much again, Aprajita, for coming and giving this really awesome talk. I learned a lot about so many different telescopes that I actually use. So um, it was really uh, very informative. And I think Women, Women in Astronomy Day was yesterday. So happy belated Women in Astronomy yeah, Day. You too. <laughs> well, it's nice to meet you. And thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much. All right. Excellent.